asked for a bit of love for our next guest and there has been an overflow of it uh, since I made that uh, reference and it's come from some very notable people in football as I welcome the former Reading and Leeds United manager and Arsenal player Brian McDermott. Johnny, nice to be here. Nice, uh, nice to see you. It's very nice to have you in the show, Brian. And I must say, as both a supporter and as a commentator, you have been there <laughs> in my ears and in my eyes in some very, very big games. Obviously, as a reporter, I remember you a number of times as Reading manager steering them to the Premier League. But back in the 1980s, you were there scoring goals for Arsenal in our most memorable games. Tony Woodcock popped five in the net at Villa Park and you scored the other one in an unrepeatable 6-2 win for Arsenal. And, <laughs> and an even bigger game for the Villa in which we won the Football League Championship, the big one, at Highbury. You scored in that game as you beat us on the last day of the season. I think you're the only person in England who knew that I was the one person who scored the goal when Tony Woodcock scored five. I scored the sixth goal in that game where we beat Villa 6-2. And you told me that yesterday and I thought, wow, this guy knows more about me than I do. <laughs> and then we did we did beat Villa last game of the season. I think it was, what was it, 1981? 80 yeah. Right. Yeah, and uh, you guys won the league. We came third and I scored one of the goals in that game. 60,000 people at Highbury that day. It was amazing day. and there were about 9,000 of us. Oh no, it was it was amazing. Maybe even more. Yeah, I do remember that day. I remember it really, really well. And uh, it was a great day for Villa that day, I know that. Now, you have it was a great day. And it's not been repeated. <laughs> well, we've come we've come close. We've finished second twice since it, but you know, that's another story. But we've got a very big story to tell about uh Brian and yesterday, even yesterday, you were in a retreat. And we spoke a couple of times during the day yesterday. You were in a retreat making a motivational speech alongside Russell Brand, talking about your life since football. Uh, no, it was talking about my life in football. And it was talking about... It's, I do this presentation where it's a, it's a story of, uh, as a player, how I felt as a player. Um, I move into management, how I felt as a, uh, as a manager, uh, and just trying to, what I consider, fill a void really more than anything. Trying to fill a void with achievement more than anything. Um, and that's what the talk's all about. And then realizing actually, you know, that's not the way to fill a void. It's to, you know, just achieving, 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 because nothing's ever good enough. Mm. Nothing, no achievements ever good. I thought being a Premier League manager was going to be the achievement that would have cracked it, and that's going to be, make the difference. It didn't. Um, I won three promotions as a, as a player, which you know, you look back, you think, well, that's not bad. And then you've done. I won three promotions as a as a manager, a scout, and a and a coach. So, but nothing was enough, and that's the problem. And 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 I don't feel like that today, and that's a godsend. Thank goodness. I mean, that is such a journey. I remember the first time. I was ever sacked and it was really quite a setback for me and I had other options in my life and I took them on the basis that I didn't like the experience of relying on other people with the vagaries of their decisions however wrong I thought they were and it was my first setback and it took until I was about 31 and one of the problems I felt and maybe this aligns itself to this idea of constantly winning and winning and trying to win and do it is never enough. I identified too much with my job. It was too much of my identity. And I was suddenly thinking, well, you know, I am someone else and something different. Mm. And that's how, I mean, I didn't turn to drink. I just turned to another job and another opportunity. I was 31 or 32, I was quite young. But, but that's part of the psychology, isn't it? That you mm. bury yourself in your career, in your job, and it becomes your identity. So if it's taken away from you, then what? Um, the, that is a problem. You know, I was Brian the footballer or yeah. Brian McDermott the manager. Yeah. And I would introduce myself as Brian McDermott. I manage Reading, not just Brian or Brian McDermott. I play for Arsenal or Brian McDermott. I play for Leeds and uh, I manage Leeds. Mm. Because it was a, the, the, there was a part of me that thought, well, 
I might be half interested if I tell people that I'm a football manager or something. And then all of a sudden people start talking to me about whatever, about managing and this, that and the other. I don't do that now. I just talk about me as a person and what I do now. And, uh, I, you know, it's really important for me not to be just a a job. Mm. I'm not just a job. You mm. know, I'm a, I'm a father. Um, I'm a granddad. I'm a husband. I'm a friend to people. And, and that's far more important to me these days. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about what you said to the crowd that was there yesterday? How many people were there? Yesterday, probably yeah. about 50 or 60 50 people. 50 or 60 people. Yeah. And they, they're there, and Russell Brand's there as well. Mm-hmm. And it's in Buckinghamshire, it's in a retreat. And do you find talking is still a form of therapy, or are you there because you've gone down the road of your improvement away from alcoholism and mental health issues for the people that you're you're meeting what is the motivation now the motivation for me is uh is service really it's to give mm. back mm-hmm. and that's the most important mm-hmm. thing for me i like to go out and do my presentation and look the, the presentation is about a lot of things the presentation is about resilience you know we lost a playoff final i talk about this and uh the pain of losing the playoff final in 2011 to, to Swansea was, I can't even describe it, mm. you know, because the winning for me was never as good as the losing was bad. Mm-hmm. And for three months, it was horrific after that playoff final. And I had to, we had to bounce back as a football club. We lost the first five out of seven games when I was at Reading. And then we went on a run and then we managed to win the league. And then you would think, you, you win the league, you think, oh, everything's going to be great and you're a Premier League manager. And then, your ego, my ego started to take control of, now I'm somebody, people like know me, but I didn't feel any different inside. I just felt maybe it's something else. Maybe I need something else. Maybe it was whatever it was. Um, and I, I became someone I didn't like because mm. um, I've got this two sides to me. I've got this small self-esteem, not feeling good enough, but I also feel that I can be in a dressing room, talk to the players and the staff, and convince everyone we can win this and we're at Liverpool or we're at Man United or at Man City. And that was how it was. So I've always got that two sides to me. I mean, I remember we played, um, when I was at Leeds, we we played Sheffield Wednesday on January the 1st. I'll never forget this game. And there's a part of me, when I'm sat in a dressing room on my own, it's half past two, I'm literally sat there and there's a part of me that always goes, we could lose this 6-0. Mm. This could be the most embarrassing thing ever. And every single game. And then the other part think, we're going to win. We're going to win. But there was that <laughs> other part that said, and on that particular day, we lost 6-0. <laughs> and they keep showing it on Sky TV. And I think to myself, well. Um, but it did happen once. Yeah. It happened once. And that was that was in my mind. But, listen, it didn't happen regularly. It only happened once, and thank God. No, you had, you had a lot of success. Yeah. And you are, perhaps alongside Steve Koppel, an absolute legend and hero of Reading. I mean, you could walk in there to a massive standing applause. Yeah, Even listen, uh, look, the, the Reading people are, are fabulous, I have to say, and the Leeds people. The Reading, I mean, I'm doing the, the presentation in, in, in Reading in a, next month, um, and I thought, oh, okay, we'll do one night, and then that went, all the tickets went, and then we did another night, and all the tickets went, and then we're doing another night, and I just, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful. They're good people, yeah. and... I've had a lot of support from them and I've always had a lot of support for them and uh, from them. And I was there for 13 years and yes. uh, I have to say under Steve, I love Steve, he, it was just great. He's a great guy and uh, a fabulous manager and, and I learned a lot from him. When did the drinking start? Did it start when you were a player? I mean, we know about the drink culture at Arsenal. I mean, mm. Tony Adams was was king of it, wasn't he? It was just part of the 70s and 80s culture. That's how it was. I mean, you know, they used to say that the best teams were the best drinkers. <laughs> you know, Liverpool, Man United, Arsenal. And in the 70s and 80s, that's kind of how it was. Right. My drinking story was, if I've had a drink, I, I didn't stop. I, I didn't finish with one or two drinks, but I could go long, long, long periods of time. I was professional in what I was doing in my job and I yeah. went long periods of time, but then when I picked a drink up, I... I drank too much, and, and that was the same story as a manager as well. Picked the drink up, and uh, I drank too much. I haven't had a drink for seven and a half years now. And, Amazing. Uh, it's, uh, it's the best thing I have ever done by a country mile. 
And did you feel, even as a professional sportsman, I mean, people like McGrath and Whiteside, and you hear about it, and Tony Adams, who was sick on the pitch before kickoff. Mm. It happened. I mean, I, I saw it for myself, and obviously his drinking Merson went into rehab. These are famous uh, stories. Did you feel, actually, at that point, I mean, you don't need Arsene Wenger to tell you, <laughs> do you, that actually it's going to diminish your performance? Well, uh, that... that I think it was because, as a player, it, it was happening an awful lot. Yeah, and yeah. Most but did it? Like, I think so, back in our day. But like, you were I mean, like 23, you think you can conquer the world, you yeah, train. Yeah, 23, hard. you're training. And yeah. you know, back in the day, and I'll never forget, players used to put black bin liners on on a Monday morning to sweat out the alcohol from the weekend. It was just crazy. It's terrible. Absolutely crazy, you know. Um, it's amazing that that was happening. That's terrible. But it was, but it was encouraged. Yeah. That, you know, it, it, it was, was actually it was encouraged. It was called. Cure. It was called team spirit. <laughs> you know, and that's what you know, team spirit in the, yeah. in the bottom of a bottle, and that's kind of how it was. Yeah. Um, and that, that I don't, I don't think that's the culture now. I, I don't know no. what the culture is with the, with the dress rooms now so much. But there'll always be something. You know, you, you hear a lot about gambling, you hear a lot about gaming, you hear a lot about all sorts of things. You hear a lot going. about drug taking as well. Well, I don't know. I don't know. You know I mean, I'm not going to mention who and what and where, but um, it need, there needs to be some sort of discussion about it. I'll be surprised. Listen, I don't know. I mean, I know there's a lot of drug testing. I have no, no idea. Mm -hmm. um, that was not part of my story. Yeah. I, and I never talk about other people's experiences. I can only ever talk about, about mine. And that's, that's all I can do and that's all I ever do. And I'm not sat here giving anybody um, uh, any advice. I'm not the I'm not the alcohol police. I can just say this is what happened to me. I don't drink anymore. I I, I, uh, I have got a really good group of people around me. I couldn't stop drinking on my own, although I tried to on many many times, but I couldn't stay stopped. And and now I've stayed stopped for seven and a half years because I've got great people around me. Amazing. This is Brian McDermott, former Reading and Leeds United manager being as frank as you could ever be here on Talk TV. Do you have a question for him? I have a number of them. We're going to talk in great detail about them here on Talk TV. And, of course, you have access to the phone, 08, uh, 0344 You can text us at Talk TV. Don't forget to stick Talk at the beginning of your text to get through to us. You can tweet us at Talk TV and at Johnny Gould. And as I say, I, there's been a lot of love for you on um, social media since I um, since I asked uh, for um, some support, including Alan Smith, oh. uh, former Crystal Palace manager. Well nice done, man. Brian. Massive support from my end. Best wishes to Alan. Philip Astor, great stuff, Brian. Thank you very much. Paul Stewart, oh. well done, Brian. Glad you took that massive step. You will make a difference. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Kevin Bedell. Proud of all you're doing, Brian, and so many more. It's Brian McDermott here in the studio, Johnny Gould on the Sunday Night Club. This is your Sunday Night Club, and a warm welcome to you wherever you are, 03444991000, to talk to our very special guest, former Reading and Leeds United manager and Arsenal player, Brian McDermott. Don't forget, after the news at the top of the hour, we're going to have Mark Halsey, former Premier League referee, and believable Jeff, Jeff Shreves, will be with us to talk about his new book, uh, Tales from the Touchline. And uh, he's going to, I mean, just, he's really been there. And being a Touchline reporter, I can tell you, is a wonderful job because you really, really get to see the underbelly of football, the tension, the pressure, the angry managers, the bottles being thrown around, the furiosity of the players, the, the high energy. And we'll talk to Jeff about that. But in the meantime, Brian McDermott, I always remember your media interviews were well worth a watch. Apart from anything, you have a very, very good memory and you have a very sharp intellect. There was no, obviously, Brian, about your interviews. There was a lot to be said in the games. Uh, well, I talked about the game. That's what I tried yeah, to do. Yeah, but you talked about the game in a way that was engaging and people wanted to hear, mm. especially a winning side like Reading. Yeah, it's it's a lot easier to talk about the game when you're winning. Let's put it that way. <laughs> there was a time at Leeds when it wasn't easy to talk because there was a yeah. lot of stuff going on when when the ownership changed at Leeds with Massimo Cellino. But I had to try and keep fronting up and and talking, and that would have been a difficult time for me at that time just to, just fronting up and and talking about that time. But listen, when you're winning, it's it's dead easy to sit mm -hmm. in front of a microphone. Mm -hmm. And tell us about. Um, the the journey that you've taken 
since football. You said to us, you said to me just before we came back that I've never chased a job before. Mm. It's always come around for you. So I suppose now that you're off the merry-go-round, notwithstanding all the media appearances that you're making at the moment, people don't necessarily think about you if you're not chasing it. I don't know, to be honest. Um, but, well, I, I've, I've been very, very, very lucky in my football. I kind of fell into a job after I, I stopped playing. Alan Pardew gave me a, the job as chief scout and under-17 manager at Reading, and he didn't really know me, Alan, so I'll always appreciate that. Um, in 2009, Brendan was at the football club, Brendan Rodgers, Rogers, yeah. and left, and they asked me to be caretaker, and, and we won at Anfield in the Cup, and I managed to get the job. Having not had the best of league records, we lost two. We, I think we lost three and drew two of my first five in the league. So it wasn't particularly overwhelming, but we were doing who all right. Who was in, the cup. in that Liverpool team and who was manager? Was it Sunes? Benitez. I thought Benitez. Ooh, well done. Yeah, so we went in 1 0 down, I think at half time, Stephen Gerrard had scored. And then Shane, Shane scored, Shane Long scored in the 92nd minute. Sorry, that's not true. Gilfie Sigerson scored, Shane got the penalty. And then in the extra time, Shane's got the winner. So I'll always thank Shane for that. Shane thank you, Long. Shane. Thank you. I think you got me the job. <laughs> that was a good result. Well done. How did Reading do in the next round? We went to Bur- we, had, we played Berlin. We won. And I think we got to the quarter final that year and we lost to Villa. Uh, we were 2 0 up, actually. Actually, you might have been there. We were 2 0 up at half time. I brought the boys in at half time. We had a chat and I said, listen, if you can see this out for the first 15 minutes, we win this game. If we can stay at 2 0. Anyway, after uh, 60 minutes, we were 3 2 down, so that didn't work out too well. <laughs> what would you have said at half time with hindsight? I'd have said the same. Would you? Yeah, that's football. Sometimes. So you trust you trust your players to carry out your duty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. Yeah. So when they cross the line, no, I mean, there are can, the... you can make a difference if yeah. you're on the line. You can change things, and you. Can, I don't. I'm not one of these managers who say once they've crossed the line, it's all over. You can't. You can't mm. change things. Mm. No, you can. You know, you can you can have a positive look at what you're trying to do from the line. You can make positive substitutions. You can change things. There's absolutely no doubt about mm. that. You know, you can change the mindset of a of a wide player, for example. Sure. You know, depending on what you're saying to him. And I know I've played out wide. Um, and what the manager's saying to the wide players is really, really important. I always remember Graham Taylor telling me frequently when I was covering Villa in the 80s and early 90s, he said a winger only needs 20 minutes of star play in order to change a game. And he was talking about Tony Daly in those mm. days. And Tony Daly was uh, was wicked. He was fantastic. Very quick. On the right-hand side, just crossing the ball in for David Platt, who glanced them in in that wonderful side and he's absolutely right but then he also said defense was the cornerstone of any winning side you needed a defense to start a football team 100 percent. you need a good goalkeeper you need a really good defense um and you need players that are in it together you know where where the team is so much more important than the individual mm. and i've been fortunate uh, especially at reading we had that we had that uh where the players put their ego to bed as soon as they come to the to the dressing room, yeah. and they did what they had to do. And uh, you know, even the ones that weren't playing, they wanted the players on the pitch to do well. Yeah. And that's unusual. Well, that's wonderful. It's really yeah. unusual. That is good. Just before the break, you talked about I've been without a drink for seven and a half years, and I have people around me who love me and protect me, look after me, and I have a full life as mm. a dad and a husband. I'm a granddad as well. Um, because you have that sort of barrier, that love and affection, that support you have, and you want to be a good friend as well. Um, do you still have the urge for a drink? Um, a lot? No. Um, good. Do I have the urge for a drink? So when I, if I, if I had a drink today, I would have the urge. That, that would, would come you? straight You'd just back. Start again, would you? Straight back. Straight How back. do you know that? I know. You just know. Yeah, I tried to stop on my own many times. I, I stopped for six months once and uh, I had a drink and it started all over again. So really? I don't want to take that chance. Yeah. And that's not, I'm not, I'm not a normal drinker. I, I'm a person that has one and that's it. And, and why, why do you, why do you drink? Well, I don't drink. So, no, no, no. So, why, no, so, no, sorry. Why did? Why, sorry. Why, what I meant was why you know when you you have one I mean it's it's a nice buzz or whatever or whatever, whatever that's a spirit slightly different emotion whatever feeling 
Why do you have another? Why do you need another one? It, it's not as big a buzz next time. The third one, the fourth one. Why? Why? Do you, why does someone keep going? Do you know what? what? Is it? what Johnny, is it? the whys and wherefores for me, it doesn't matter to me. I, I don't know the answer no. to that, but it is me. Um, when I used to drink after a defeat, it used to numb the pain of the defeat. Right. Until it stopped working. Right. And then when it stops working, and it did stop working for me, um, then it became a problem. Um, and I just got to a point when I was just sick and tired of it. I just didn't want to be that person anymore. And I didn't want to feel the way that I was feeling in the morning. I'd wake up in the morning. Um, that real sort of foggy, horrible feeling that you yeah. get. Um, and I didn't want that anymore. And I just thought, said one day, I just reached out. And the first time I reached out, I reached out to my wife when I was 53. I said, look, I can't do this anymore. And she helped me and she got she got me help. And and I, that's what I would say to anybody. Anyone who was asking me, just reach out, just talk to someone. I think that's so important. I mean, I was brought up in, a, in an era when uh, you, you, you had to man up. You, you don't talk mm. and you don't tell anyone. It's a weakness. Mm -hmm. um, and my biggest weakness was not talking. Mm -hmm. And even when I was struck, and I spoke to Nigel Gibbs yesterday, uh, this morning actually, I said, Nigel, you never knew, did you? He said, no, I never knew. Because I was always professional, you know, mm -hmm. I was always professional. And Nigel was my assistant manager and a great, great guy. And he was as close to me as anybody was. And he, he did not know that, that, that I had an issue with it. And uh, I, I could still do my job. Oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand. Tweets coming in. Stan and Bob's dad has tweeted. Brian, well done, mate. I'm reading this verbatim for being so strong. I think many people from many backgrounds and careers can relate to everything you have said tonight. The last few years may have exacerbated many tragic situations. Keep safe. And this is a message not just from football, not just from the high density depression. My wife um, is talks about college. She, you know, we're, we're not a drinking family. I don't mm. drink a lot. I mean, I drink the odd glass of wine, and that's enough for me, mm. actually, because I think the first buzz is quite enough. I don't need any more. I'm not a big <coughs> drinker, but there's a drink culture, and I think in a sales environment, you know, in any in any job where there's pressure to deliver results of any kind, people people get drunk. They think they're having fun, and suddenly, ten years down the line. They've given themselves some sort of damage to their liver mm. and shorten their work career. Mm. Look, I, I'm not judge and jury on, on what people do. No. You know, once I can, once again, if someone asked me a question, what did you do? I would tell them what I did. And, and that's, the, that's the key for me, just talking about my own experience. Um, and I'm not the alcohol police. I just know that my life is enhanced no end since I stopped and I have never woken up in the morning and thought I wish I'd got drunk last night I wish I had a drink last night really I've never felt like that in the last seven and a half years wonderful not once wonderful. I have woken up after having a dream that I've dr that I've been drunk oh really and I thought oh no and I've panicked and then after about 30 seconds I realise I'm alright it's a dream it's the best feeling ever <laughs> to actually wake up to reality is yeah, really nice yeah absolutely now do you think sport as a profession is a uniquely pressurised situation? Um, Wazza has talked about it, and he, uh, Rooney, talked about turning to drink to deal with stresses when he was a player during his early career. And, of course, he was physically large and big, and you can imagine him having the body, if you like, the capacity as a top player to deal with it without anyone noticing. He actually thinks it took a few years off the back end of his career. Um, it the level that these guys play at now in the Premier mm, League, mm, you'd notice. You would know. You yeah. know, the, it's not the same culture as it was in the eighties and the seventies. I would suggest. So, if you're trying to drink and you're trying to perform at the level you have to perform in the Premiership, it it, it would take some. It would take some doing to perform. And, and, uh, but, you know, some of these young guys, maybe they do. I don't, I don't know. Mm. I don't know what the drinking culture is like. Now, I, I don't think it's anywhere near what it used to be in the 70s and 80s. But there, there's other things, Johnny. There, there's other things like the mobile phones and social media. Oh. Um, and we, we didn't have that. No. And I look at it now and, you know, if you're a professional footballer, a Premier League footballer, a championship, Div 1, 2, whatever, and you're looking at your phone at 3 o'clock in the morning... Uh, and you're doing whatever you're doing, 
that can't be that can't be that can't be a good thing. Ed Bill has just tweeted us. Good luck, Brian. I've not had a drink for twenty two years. Well done. And every year I send myself a birthday card, and I'm looking forward to my twenty third <laughs> birthday card. That's a nice message. Well done. Um, well done, says Brian. Well done, everyone here at Talk TV. Brian, what does the future hold for you? I mean, you're happy in yourself, aren't mm. you? And you're happy being Brian McDermott, but you are still involved in the game now. Yeah, I do a lot. I do. Um, I look at a lot of games, and I try and pick out one or two 17, 18 year olds to to pop into pro clubs. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of players in the in the leagues, the lower leagues that can play in the league. And I try and find one or two, and I've put one into Reading recently, Great. one into Orient recently, just to try and give them a chance. And I really enjoy that, and enjoy working with good people and good good young players. I'm doing my presentation which I, I do all over the place, really, and different organisations and clubs and uh, and companies. And, you know, it's called Winning, Losing, Mental Health and Finding Balance. And there's a lot of stuff in there. There's an awful lot of stuff in there. It's about leadership. It's about winning big. It's about losing big. It's about resilience. And it's about finding balance. And, and I really enjoy doing that. Uh, and I'm just about to finish the LMA mentoring course where, you know, I could mentor managers, which I think could be a... A really good thing as well. I wish I had a wish I had someone that would have been there for me. Really, fantastic. Mm. I'm going to start a rumor here. <laughs> Gary Shaw was obviously a wonderful young player at Aston Villa. Suffered terrible injuries. When I was Beacon Radio sports editor, Walsall and Shrewsbury were at the bottom of the Championship, and I said, surely someone's going to benefit from Walsall and Shrewsbury to him. He had a trial at Shrewsbury, didn't make it. He signed for Walsall and scored the fastest hat-trick in the history of the championship because I knew he would. Mm. What about you in the Republic of Ireland, Brian? Would you fancy yourself at international level? Oh, look, that, that, that's a long, long story. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's my country, you know, and, I, and I, yeah. I've told this story many, many times. I played you weren't for born in Ireland, though, were you? No, my mum and dad, mum's from Slough, from yes, Clare. Yes, McDermott is an yeah, Irish name, isn't and it? and my, my, my father was from Sligo, and my grandparents from... Clare and Sligo as well so I played for England at 17 in the mini world cup but Don Howe was the coach at Arsenal at the time and I was really kind of scared of authority at the time and scared of a lot of things <laughs> and um, when I was 18 I knew that there's no disrespect to England it's just how it is for me and I feel completely Irish yeah you're Irish and that's, that's who you are and that's who I am and uh, I, I, f I felt that at, uh, it took me a long. Well, I, have I got over that fact that I didn't play for Ireland? You know what I would give for one cap, and it's probably not going to happen for me now at sixty-one years of probably age. Probably not. Probably not going to happen. To be a manager, that would be a wonderful gift, wouldn't yeah, it? Uh, listen, I, I'd carry the players' kit for Ireland. You know, that's what I do, just to wear the tracksuit. So, Brian for Ireland. Let's here. <laughs> Come on. No, they got hashtag good Brian for Ireland. Brian McDermott, it's been a lovely conversation. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your story, and I think, and I'm sure, I'm certain that you've helped a lot of people. Brian McDermott, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Johnny, appreciate it. It's been absolutely brilliant.